Welcome to this, the eighth meeting of the Equality and Human Rights Committee in 2018. I make the usual uh, request that mobile devices are switched to airplane mode and off the table, please. Um, agenda item one this morning is uh, a decision on taking agenda item three in private. Our committee agreed to take agenda item yes. three in private. Thank you very much. Agenda item two is the continuation of uh, our business on the UK withdrawal from European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill. And... Uh, we know that Parliament has agreed to treat the bill as an emergency bill and the bill has completed its stage one consideration in the Chamber on the 7th of March and stage two amendments after a marathon session were completed about 9.45 last night. Um, Section 5 of the bill seeks to save the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights into Scots law as it applies to devolved matters. So following all of that, we have a session this morning with the Minister for UK Negotiations in Scotland, Scotland's Place in Europe, Michael Russell, and his Scottish Government officials this morning are Alison Cool, Graeme Fisher, Duncan Isles, and Luke McBratney. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I know that you had a marathon session over the past few days. No doubt you're tired, but well-versed in the ways of the continuity yeah. bill. Um, so we've got about 45 minutes with you this morning because we know you've got to be another committee. I don't know if you want to make a very brief opening statement. No, happy no, I, to. I think, I think I'm very happy to answer questions. I think that we'll, we'll get more out of that. Okay, thank you very much. So on that note, Gail Ross. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Minister, you have previously stated that if agreement was found on the um, UK government's EU withdrawal bill, that the continuity bill would fall. If this were the case, how can we ensure that the Charter of Fundamental Rights protections can still be maintained in Scotland, given that the, UK's government, the UK government's position is that the Charter will not be taken into UK law? I, I think that is a, a, one of the downsides if the bill were to be withdrawn, but uh, we have made a clear commitment to withdraw the bill where an agreement found. Can I just explain that why that is? Uh, and indeed, that commitment will be clearer now because uh, I think the last amendment which uh, was accepted, I accepted last night during the stage two process, was one from Liam Kerr, uh, which uh, 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 indicated and we agreed that the whole bill would fall uh, if we decided uh, to, to move in that direction rather than bits of the bill. And that, is, that honours the commitment that we have made. Um, the best way in terms of the overall process of, of withdrawal, and I don't think there's any good withdrawal and I don't agree with withdrawal, and I think Brexit is the wrong thing to happen, but the, on the technicalities, which we've always said have to be observed because you can't leave the country without, a, without law in place uh, and European law is enmeshed with our own lives over the last 50 years, the best way to do it is by a single bill to which legislative, legislative consent is given by the devolved administrations, by Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland, if it were, uh, 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 sitting. Um, and we've endeavoured and are endeavouring to get an agreement on that. The UK government did not consult on the draft bill before they published it. Uh, we had two weeks, I think, to talk about it, um, but nothing compared to what should have happened in terms of how you put together legislation that requires legislative consent. Um, we've been in endeavouring to say that whilst we don't like the bill, there's lots of things we don't like, our place, in terms of devolved administrations, is to say if we can make it work with you to do the right things, we'll do so. Now, we can't make the bill work because there are bits of it that run against devolution and create a mess, frankly, in areas such as agriculture, fisheries, some health areas, some legal areas, environment. Uh, there is a mess. But uh, we could sort that mess in in terms of the detail and in terms of the law, not in terms of what we like. The proper place to amend it in terms of these issues would then be the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Now, I don't say that with any pleasure. I think this, this Parliament should be able to decide everything. But given the present constitutional settlement, that's the proper place to amend it. Now, the House of Commons chose not to amend it. There were, as you know, split views, even in the, in the Tory party, but it didn't um, succeed. In, it, you will have read Ken Clark's tremendous speech on it from the House of of Commons. It is now in the House of Lords and the House of Lords will be able to take a position on it. The House of Lords may take a different position on it. Um, I, I don't necessarily look to the House of Lords to save me on many occasions, but we should look to the House of Lords to see if this is ventilated properly. And indeed, I have uh, brief peers on, on our own position on these things uh, in recent weeks. Uh, if they don't do so, then I think then that becomes a matter for the wider debate within the country and those of us who want to see the protection of 
rights uh, need to find a way to secure it. One way, of course, would be to retain this and also to be part of the single market and the customs union. In other words, to keep the closest possible alignment between ourselves uh, and the EU and not to go down this uh, uh, rabbit hole of assuming that we will get away from everything and there'll be a wonderful world. It won't. It'll be a rabbit hole. Um, and we need to recognise that. Thank you. Do you, th do you think there, there's any way that we can incorporate the principles of human rights in EU law without adopting the Charter? I think the best way to t it forward would be to take the Charter into, our, into Scots law, as we have indicated in this. And that's one of the differences in our approach to withdrawal, uh, the withdrawal legislation from the UK approach. This is the best way to do it. Uh, interestingly, uh, that also appears to be the Scottish Conservative position after uh, the, the last two days, because the uh, indication was given, I think, by Mr Tompkins that he would uh, drop uh, our, our approach uh, to, to the, some things, but he would keep our approach to uh, this issue. Um, uh, there's good reason, he said, to maintain the position of the Charter of Fundamental Rights in Scots law after exit day. So I, I welcome that, and presumably then there will be a unanimous view that that's what should be happening and should presumably be happening at Westminster too. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Gail. Um, Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, uh, panel. Um, it's uh, good to see you again, uh, Minister. I think we've spent far too much time together these, these last few days, but nonetheless, it's been a... Both <laughs> um, So I just wanted to press you on a, a few points uh, based on the evidence session that she had last week, which was extremely helpful. Um, and it's probably worth, at this point, just placing on record my uh, thanks to the clerks and uh, staff of this committee for... Uh, cobbling together some excellent uh, research notes, especially uh, those from SPICE on uh, the implications of the continuity bill and its relevance to this committee. I th think they've been extremely helpful, so uh, thank you to uh, all members for that. Um, Tobias Locke, in his evidence session last week, stated that no uh, non-EU country had ever adopted the Charter uh, or indeed uh, proactively sought to incorporate uh, EU directives, regulations, laws, etc., into their domestic law. Uh, can the Minister just clarify why he thinks Scotland should? Well, no country's ever left the EU before, so I suppose that contextualises the, the issue. Um, I, I think it's very simple. Uh, the reality is this provides the protections that we have got used to. This underpins the system of human rights that we want to have. And therefore, I think, even though, uh, uh, and I should point out that Scotland did not vote to leave the EU, so by extension, Scotland did not vote to have the Charter removed from, uh, from, from the protections removed from us. In all those circumstances, it is the right thing to do. It is the progressive thing to do. And uh, I'm glad that uh, a, a, um, Professor Tompkins agrees with me. I quote him again. There is good reason to maintain the position of the Charter of Fundamental Rights in Scots law. So presumably he does not... Uh, I'm not sure Dr Locke indicated it shouldn't be done. He, indicated, uh, he simply indicated that nobody else had done it. Well, do you know, I think a bit of innovation does us no harm as the Scottish Parliament. Thank you for that answer. Um, so if in, in the circumstance, therefore, that um, the Charter is incorporated in Scots law... Uh, but not in other parts of the United Kingdom. What uh, does the Minister think the consequences of having, for example, parallel frameworks around different approaches to human rights might be uh, with regards to liabilities on the state, with regards to uh, different approaches from a policy point of view? And is he 100% clear and confident that is in, eff in effect uh, within the competence of the Scottish Parliament to adopt uh, human rights and equalities elements, uh, is he entirely uh, happy that those are uh, <coughs> retained, devolved EU matters and not reserved in any way? And that's more of a technical question rather than a political one. Yeah, I'm entirely happy because we're dealing with uh, a devolved competence and these are, we are dealing with putting this into uh, Scottish law in a way that is consistent with the constitutional settlement. So I'm, I'm entirely happy and uh, I'm entirely happy that the bill in all its regards fits within competence. This is a you know, discussion that's been going on for the last uh, couple of weeks, no doubt will continue for some particular period of time, but we're absolutely uh, fine. We can, we can legislate on human rights differently. The question is, in my view and with respect, not what us doing something which somebody else isn't doing, 
It is with us holding on to something which is being taken away from other people. Uh, that's actually the difference. Now, I'm comfortable. I'd like everybody to be protected by this. I don't really see why people who require these protections in other parts of the United Kingdom should have them taken away from them. But uh, I, if I have the ability to allow these to continue in Scotland, that's what I would want to do. So I think it's quite important just to recognize that. This is not about saying, let's do something differently in Scotland. This is about saying, this works for us. Uh, this is what we want to keep, and therefore we're going to keep it. On the wider point, I, you know, I am, I am at the very relaxed end of the spectrum in terms of differences in, in actions and choices uh, within the various parts of these islands. And indeed, that is the devolved settlement, and it's really important to recognise that. Uh, I've been quoted recently as saying, I think one of the problems that we've got into in the negotiation of the United Kingdom is that we're dealing often with ministers uh, in the United Kingdom who, for the best reasons, do not understand devolution and never operated it. And it's necessary for us to remind the United Kingdom government that devolution exists. It is the constitutional settlement. It was voted for by the Scottish people. I may wish to go further, but the reality is that's where we are. It is in that, it, that immortal phrase, the settled will of the Scottish people. But it's also the settled constitutional will of all parts of these islands. And therefore, we should recognize that and it should be respected by the United Kingdom government. Uh, I have no further questions, but it's probably worth adding that the minister said in the previous answer that Scotland did not vote for Brexit. With the greatest of respect, Scotland is not the member state of the European Union, it's the United Kingdom, and it's the United Kingdom that voted for Brexit. And I think that should also be respected. No further questions. Okay. Um Alex Cole-Hamilton. Thank you, convener. Good morning, Minister, and good morning to the officials. Thank you for coming to see us today. I'd like to uh, start by uh, focusing on Section 13, which has obviously exercised my party in its deliberations around uh, the Stage 1 and Stage 2 proceedings in, in respect of keeping pace and the powers that this Parliament may be about to confer on Scottish ministers in respect of keeping pace with EU legislation after withdrawal. Um, now, obviously, I think we've made some progress on this, and I'm grateful to the government for the concessions it's made so far, and uh, I look forward to further discussions on that. But irrespective of the progress that's been made, if we confer power to Scottish ministers for whatever period of time to, by regulation, keep pace with directives from the European Union, um, as an Equalities and Human Rights Committee, we obviously have a duty of care to the scrutiny that these uh, changes have, um, particularly around uh, equalities and human rights. And I'm concerned that if we are doing uh, things through ministerial regulation, they won't have things like the statutory requirements for an equalities impact assessment or a child rights impact assessment. Can the minister explore how we square that circle and make sure that such scrutiny can take place, particularly on relevant uh, directives and, and regulations that the minister might choose to make? Yes, I, I, I mean, I think we should <coughs> recognise that the power under Section 13 <coughs> is of limited scope and is designed uh, to do essentially m comparatively minor matters. Uh, I mean, I'm not by that dissing fish health or, or, or invasive species or, or any of those animal health, uh, but I'm not saying this is a means by which ministers would seek to take very major issues forward on, on a regular basis. I also, as you correctly pointed out, um, um, accepted substantial changes to this, <coughs> sorry, in the stage two process, and many of those came from uh, your colleague, uh, Tavish Scott, and we will continue in discussion about other items of them. Um, that having been said, the section 13 power is an important power, and there could be areas which the Scottish Government, in consultation with the committee and with stakeholders, uh, uh, and in this area, would believe it was useful to have. Now, this, uh, this would require the Minister to make a, a, a recommendation, for the Parliament to be satisfied that this was the right thing to happen by the affirmative uh, procedure, for there be, to be, and it, it, sometimes that could even be by the super affirmative procedure, I don't believe that should be of right, but it, it could be, and in no circumstances it would be wider consultation. This committee would be absolutely entitled, and I would encourage it to uh, you know, hold hearings on that matter, to, to look at it, so this is not without scrutiny. But if we are to recognize, for example, the importance of regulatory alignment in some key areas, and in some issues, as in the Northern Irish border, that's crucial, then it is important there's a power that allows us to give effect to regulatory alignment without having to go through the process 
of primary legislation on every single occasion, um, because I think that that would be a difficult thing to do, and in some areas would negate the, the issue of keeping pace. Now, you know, the argument has been, well, you know, the UK government didn't want this because they didn't put it in their withdrawal bill. <coughs> I think that the situation we've got now is that we need it. It should have been in the withdrawal bill, and we put it in our own. I'm grateful to the Minister for that answer. Um, in respect of the times that we agree that actually primary legislation is required, um, is, uh, is there a view as to um, how, you know, considering we have quite a full diet of legislation in this Parliament already, um, ha has any sort of scoping been done as to what level of legislation, what increased level of legislation we br would be brought forward and how that would stand up to scrutiny? We, we, uh, we have estimated in terms of secondary legislation, um, I, you know, 300 plus items of secondary legislation simply for this process. And that's a lot for this parliament. That's a year's worth for this parliament, at least. It could be more. Uh, you know, it, it is difficult to tell because we don't know from the United Kingdom government precisely what they're going to propose. We do believe that these things, some of these things should be done jointly with the United Kingdom government. But so in secondary legislation, estimates exist, work is done, and it continues to be done. It's a very complex task, and it's not, it's not just about bringing law back in. It is about correcting deficiencies, too, and, and, and that is a serious, serious business. In terms of primary legislation, no, but we do know, for example, that the UK government intends to bring forward uh, an agriculture bill, a fisheries bill, a trade bill, and in fact, trade bill is the first part of the trade bill anyway, it's in the House of Commons. So we, we can see things coming. Now, that is then complicated, but I'm sorry to complicate it even further. That's complicated by where we are with the negotiations with the UK government. Because if we were, and we've indicated our willingness to establish frameworks, for example, covering issues in agriculture, um, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's one of the areas uh, which is in this list of 24 or 25, depending how you define it. Um, so in those areas, if there was a framework and there was then legislation, <coughs> there would be a process of agreeing that and of developing the legislation in a way that suited Scotland and, and, and matched Scottish circumstances. So I think we are in for a heavy programme of secondary legislation, a, if we could resolve the present dispute with the UK, a heavy pro process of legislative consent, and if the frameworks are such that we also require Scottish legislation, a fairly heavy programme there too. So I think we've got quite a bit of legislating ahead of us. Now, you, know, you and I, I think, agree that there are, it would be better to spend our time on things other than Brexit, you know, this is a massive distraction. This is a black hole that's sucking resource and energy and uh, initiative into it. But we are regrettably where we are. Um, and therefore, we will have to look at that program very seriously. I just hope we're not going to have stayed 11 hours of stage two over 24 hours. But yeah, <laughs> what else am I doing? Thank you, Minister. I might come back in later. For this okay. <coughs> Alex, Mary Fee. Thank you, um, Good morning, panel. Um, I wanted to um, raise with you, Minister, the same issues I raised last week with Tobias Locke, and it's in relation to employment rights. Because much of the, the employment protection that we have in this country comes from Europe. And I am concerned that there could potentially be some slippage in rights for um, workers. And I just wonder if you could comment on that and how um, the, the legislation that, that is before us, how you will protect workers' rights post-Brexit. Well, I, I, I don't want to be unkind to ministers of the United Kingdom government. I mean, I'm, I'm sure I'd be ruled out of order were I to go too far in this. But I don't necessarily accept their um, uh, assurances on these matters. I think that there is a, a deregulation imperative from some of these ministers and that they want to see a situation in which rights, workers' rights, human rights, rights of all types are diminished. Now, before Mr. Green or, or, or Ms. Wells intervenes, I accept that's not what they're saying and therefore I could be accused of being unfair about this matter, but you know, I, I don't necessarily trust the assurances we have. So the question then becomes, how can we do something about it? Now, you know, this bill in the, the, the Charter helps us along that way, and the Charter is a wider way of doing that because of what it includes, than exam for example, uh, the Human Rights Act and, and, and the European Convention. I'm not dissing the European Convention, but the, the, the Charter is a very useful uh, a, a, a tool and more useful in that regard. And, of course, ranges more widely. You know, we've, we've been having debates about environmental law uh, recently, and there are environmental uh, guarantees 
communities within that. And sometimes not as widely as you want, but pretty widely. So we've, we've, we've got all of that, and the European pillar of social rights, of course, stands there in front of us as something of, of huge imp importance to us. Um, and therefore, we, we will have to be clever and fleet of foot on this. I suppose you could look at this, and, I, and again, I don't want to be overcomplicated, but I suppose you could look at this as, as a series of steps. You know, the first step would have been, and should have been, to say to the United Kingdom government to say, we're keeping this. You know? We're keeping the good things. Even if you are seduced by this business of you know, pot of gold at the end of the trading rainbow and all the rest of it, even if you're seduced by that, then you know, it's not true. But even if you are, you could have been sensible about it and said, we're going to stay uh, in, the, in the single market and we're going to do this. That didn't happen. The next thing is, is there a way for it to happen at Westminster and there's still a route open? <coughs> and I think anybody who saw anything of the House of Lords debates over the last couple of days, and I have to say I've, I am sad enough to have glanced at them as well as having been in things here, I did think there was um, uh, some very interesting reactions in the House of Lords saying, you know, hang on a minute, you know, we're not going to be told that the, re the referendum was the be-all and end-all. You know, there are other issues applying there, and that's a possibility. There's this bill. Now, you know, this bill is there for a purpose. It has to be able to be worked. It is a workable bill. Uh, and in those circumstances, if there's no agreement with the UK, then this bill will do some of those things. Not all of those things, but some of those things. Remember, some of those things are reserved. So if, the, if we've got this bill, or we, uh, we haven't got this bill, if we haven't got the United Kingdom government on the side, then we are in the process, the old, tiring necessary process of campaigning and arguing and making sure that we are standing up for the things that we believe to be right and trying to make sure they're there. And the third sector has a big role to play in this. I was very pleased to see the agreement, you know, the, the Edinburgh agreement that they came to, the Edinburgh declaration they came to, in terms of, of rights. I think the convener was present uh, when that was signed. I think that indicates the strength of the third sector and, and other bodies to saying, no, we're not going to have this happening, and we will have to do that. We will have to assert that. This perhaps reminds us that progress, social progress, um, uh, progress in rights is not a straight line. You know, we've uh, you know, lived our lives in the view that we, everything is just going to get better and people are enlightened. That turns out not to be true. So we'll have to go to, back to that. I can't give you much more hope than that. But on the other hand, those, and I, I, you I know, uh, and myself and many people around this table have spent a lot of time campaigning, a lot of arguing, and we just have to go on doing it and saying it has to happen. No, because in, in answer to my question last week, um, Dr Locke said that if um, a, a change was made by an act of the Westminster Parliament, there would be very little um, that, that, that we could do in Scotland. And if my memory serves me right, the example he used was if the Westminster government decided that everyone was only entitled to two weeks' holiday, there was very little that we could actually do to change that. And that is a massive concern, that there, will, there, there is a potential for slippage in rights that have been very hard um, fought for and, and won. Absolutely. And this is the issue, you know, this is... One of the issues in Brexit is to make it real to people. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the, the issues in Brexit is these things which we thought, you know, were ours as of right. They, they had they'd come to us. We, we didn't realise how fortunate we were. They come because people had campaigned for them and argued for them. You know, we could take the same view of suffrage and, you know, women's role in suffrage. They, all those people campaigned and worked for them. They're there now they're at risk. Now, that might make us value them more, but it also we have to be aware that we need to find the democratic structures to continue them to be so. Now, I, my view is that I want to continue this consensus, but my view is this parliament should be making all those decisions, and if this parliament was making all those decisions, then my view is the political consensus in Scotland would ensure that those things happened and quite a lot of other things happened too. Uh, if you don't believe that and you believe that the United Kingdom is the right unit for this to happen in, then... You know, whilst I disagree with that, I now look for people to say, well, this is how it's going to work. Um, and the other question I asked Dr um, Locke about last Thursday was around Frankovich. And Frankovich, to, to me, um, although it, it's something that, that may not be used by very many people, it is still, in its essence, a, a right that um, an employee would have. And the continuity bill makes no provision for that after Brexit. And I, I know that um, Tavish Scott MSP had lodged an amendment which I supported, and that amendment has fallen. I would be grateful if you could perhaps, Minister, give me some explanation as to what you're thinking to yeah. not include Frankovic. Well, we, we do include Frankovic, and we do include a better protection for Frankovic than the United Kingdom bill, I have to say. 
Uh, so you know, what, what we do in those circumstances is that the right of action uh, does not terminate on exit day because the action hasn't been raised. The, the right continues, right? Um, but, uh, 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 the action hasn't been settled. Uh, if they, you know, but you can't give that guarantee. I see no way you can give that guarantee if you're not a member of the EU. Regrettably, I don't think it's possible to, be, to do that if you are not a member of the EU, beyond the right that we are granting. Section 8, I mean, Frankovich is actually on the face of the bill, so far from not doing it, uh, we are doing it. Um, and we say there's no right in Scots law on or after exit data damages in accordance with the rule of Frankovich, that's 8.1, um, uh, uh, and subject to any transitional transitive saving provision made by regulation under section 32, sub subsection 1, does not apply in relation to any right of action accruing before exit day. So if you've got the right to do that, before exit day, if the, if, the, if the thing about which you're complaining is before exit day, you have a continuing right. I think the real difficulty then is to say, if the thing about which you're complaining is after exit day, you are relying upon Frankovic to do something uh, which is subject to the European Court of Justice, which we won't be, so then we have a, a huge difficulty about how that actually operates. And it's also, as you know with Frankovic, partly an act of shaming, right? But, I mean, I'd be ashamed enough not to be in the EU, but there's no act of shaming that could take place there. So you'd have a very, very limited action, you know, and it would be very difficult to enforce. And I think the courts would be uncomfortable about it too. So it is not that we are doing nothing. And I, we had this very full discussion in the committee, and you were, your name was attached to, to Tavish Scott's amendment, and that was actually quite a good thing to do, because Tavish Scott must have got more amendments through than most people, so it's probably a tip for the future, attach your name to Tavish Scott. But on this occasion, he didn't get it, uh, because it is Im actually impossible to see how you would operate it. Uh, it's not that I'm not sympathetic, I just don't think it can be done. Because Frankovic is linked to EU statute? Uh, it, yeah. Well, it's, for a variety of reasons. It's linked yeah. to EU statute, and you can take that statute in, but it's, 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 although the, the, the actual quantum is decided by a, a local court or a national court, the whole regulation is set by the European Court of Justice, mm. and you're taking that whole element out. Mm. But also, it is, it is making a non-EU country responsible for rights that accrue if you are in an EU country. Mm. And I, I, you can do it, that would apply right up to the last moment of exit. And that's, you know, that's not where the UK government are, right? But it that can't apply in my view. Regrettably, regrettably, okay. it can't apply after you're not there. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. Okay, Mary. Uh, uh, Minister, I wanted to pick up a, a couple of points with you, and it's something that I had uh, spoke about in the debate the other day as well. And I've got some grave concerns around about some of our primary legislation and our domestic law which is EU directive derived. So EU directives have been you know, accepted and ratified by United Kingdom, but because we have a, a separate legal system in Scotland, we've brought forward our own primary legislation on a number of matters. And I'll give you two examples, the trafficking of human beings and child sexual exploitation and pornography, who, which are two things that were EU derived directives. But in primary law in Scotland, those laws go much further than they do in the primary law in England, and I've got a real concern on things like that. How on earth do we protect the fact that we have made, you know, a more extensive legal position on that with more protections in place for the, the people who would be victims uh, the, the, than the English law? And if those powers are re reserved or retained, how then do we ensure that we continue with that more progressive and advanced legislation? I'm going to bring Luke in a second because there's some technical issues in here, but on the political issue that you're raising, it's a considerable worry uh, because the, the way in which we can do that is because we have a devolved settlement with the legislature here that has the right to legislate in certain areas uh, and does so. So we can make those choices. Uh, another example would be minimum pricing for alcohol. We can make the decision because of the circumstances you're in. It, is, it recognizes the principle of subsidiarity in actual fact. Um, if the United Kingdom government is intent on hemming in the devolved administrations, which is what appears to be happening, um, and if these powers which are to be, uh, uh, which the UK government wishes to essentially re-reserve, are not sunsetted in any way, then in those areas, and, and of course there is no limit to those areas, the, the, the area, the 24 is there and, you know, in, in um, uh, the, the, the description, I think, of uh, Adam Tompkins yesterday, it's one of the buckets that's out there, and it has 24 items in it. As I pointed out to him yesterday, the buckets have no lids. 
you can keep throwing things into them. And you know, that's a, an, an issue for the United Kingdom government. So you could find in areas which are not on that list, suddenly they have shown an interest in and decided that they want to do something about. So respecting the devolved settlement is a political issue. That allows us to do the things we need to do. Uh, but I know that uh, uh, Luke will want to say something more. Just to confirm for the committee that Section 2 of the Continuity Bill preserves all devolved EU-derived domestic legislation, which would include the sorts of statutes that the conveners referred to, and it explicitly preserves them in relation to matters where the uh, method of implementation in Scotland has gone further yeah. than the, uh, what was required by EU law, that is under sub, uh, Section 2, Subsection 2, um, as well as the um, continuing ability to make a different choice for Scotland that the Minister refers to. Section 13 of the Bill, the Keeping Pace Power, would allow um, post-withdrawal developments to be reflected in the domestic law that the convener referred to. Okay, one of the worries that I've got is that there would be an attempt to harmonise some of these things, and harmonisation may be regression in our case, and that's, that's where, where I've got a, a worry when it comes to rights-based uh, primary legislation that we have. The, the, getting a recognition from ministers and UK ministers and, and of the existing situation and the importance of diversity and difference within it. Because you know, devolution is based upon the fact that there are some things that need to be done differently. Now, you know, as I say, some of us believe we should go much further, but the present system is based upon that diversity and also needs to be described accurately. There is no such thing as a single market, inverted commas, in the UK. Uh, there, is a, there is a uniform market, but it's not a unitary market. There is divergence and, and diversity, and that is what the settlement is. And in legislative terms, that is what the settlement is, and that needs to be recognised. Yeah, and Section 4 of the Continuity Bill, it mirror, mirrors Section 4 of the EU Withdrawal Bill, and that um, ensures that, that, that uh, devolved rights are available within Scots law. It's called the Equal Treatment uh, framework, I think it's like equal treatment legislation. Can you give us an insight into how you think that will work? Because I know both of them mirror each other, but they do slightly different things. When I'm looking for insights, I always turn to my colleagues here. So, uh, Duncan, do you want to? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Duncan. Um, it, well, e equal treatment um, legislation, uh, as the committee is aware, applies at a UK level. Um, it's brought into the law of Scotland, um, essentially through reserved uh, action. Um, the, uh, I mean, it, it's quite a complex area, which is why I'm hesitating. And, and to some extent, we're, we're straying into areas where I think I would prefer to have the uh, benefit of uh, input from uh, colleagues, uh, legal colleagues with specialist knowledge of this particular subject matter. Um, but that uh, issue of equal treatment is already part of the existing law of Scotland. It's something that we share in large measure with uh, the law that applies elsewhere in the UK. Uh, I don't think there's any suggestion that that will be undermined or eroded. There is um, uh, reference to equal treatment as part of the um, list of common framework uh, topics that remain open for discussion. Um, but, uh, I mean, we, we can write further to the committee on the yeah, detail think, of this, think, if that I would think be that helpful. would be helpful, because we know, we know where we stand as far as the Equality Human Rights Commission and their place yeah. in this as the reserved body, but with the UK-wide remit, uh, and how that interplays with the Scottish Human Rights Commission mm -hmm. and the responsibility they have to devolve matters around equal treatment. And it's a, it's a matter that the committee is very interested in, because it... it brings into sharp focus the people that, you know, the outcomes for people that, that, that we're interested in uh, around some of the protected characteristics, you know, whether it's, you know, your race, your religion, your sexuality or, or, or whatever. So the, these are the things that really interest us and how will people be protected um, and, and the concern that the regression, the regression would, would kick in there and we would lose some of those rights as well. Can you just check that you're asking about Section 43B of the Bill? Is that, I've not got that much detail. <laughs> I thought that's where your question now, if you, came I in. I take lawyers with me everywhere, just to make sure. <laughs> just, just for the you mentioned that Section 4 of the Bill corresponds to Clause 4 of the EU Withdrawal Bill. That's the case for Sections 2, 3 and 4 to a very large extent. And that is a deliberate choice by the Scottish Government 
which recognises that those sections which are about, they are effectively the continuity sections, they take all of the existing law rights as implemented and attempt to transfer them precisely into, into domestic law post-exit day. The Scottish Government, and I think this is set out in the policy memorandum, does consider that there's value in being the, the, a high level of complementarity between the way that reserved law is carried forward in exit day and devolved law. And for that reason, we've chosen to very closely um, mirror sections, clauses two, three, and four of the EU withdrawal bill in sections two, three, and four mm. of the continuity bill. Mm. I suppose just to explain what might be the technical point you've raised, although I think you've asked quite a, a detailed question actually about um, section four, uh, which, which says that uh, it saves all of the devolved rights, powers, liabilities, and then it says that doesn't apply so far as they form part of Scots law by virtue of section three or arise under an EU directive. That's simply an exception to reflect the fact that those things are saved under sections uh, two and three of the bill. So it's not trying to exclude them, it's just reflecting the fact that, that they're all saved elsewhere in the bill. So that would include, I think, the directive that you, you mentioned so far as it relates to devolved matters. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other information you can provide Indeed. us with would be incredibly helpful and we, we, we would appreciate that. Alex, go Hamilton. Thank you, Convener. Yes, I'd like to pick up on uh, the Convener's questioning there. In respect of the powers conferred on Ministers, both by Section uh, 11, 12 and 13, in, in respect of deficiencies in our international treaty obligations and indeed, as we discussed earlier, in keeping pace. Um, I want to explore that in respect of how that pertains to the Equalities Act. Um, and now it's clear that the limits of these powers will be that they cannot modify either the 2006 Equality Act or the 2010 Equality Act. However, each of the sections do suggest that it would not prevent the removal of a protection or the making of a modification if alternative provision is made in the regulations that is broadly equivalent to the protection being removed or being modified. So I'd just like to uh, uh, seek clarity, really, as to um, whether you, the Minister regards these um, the, the regulation-making powers uh, can modify or in, a, in any way equalities legislation as it stands. Um, the Minister believes that Luke has the answer. <laughs> okay. uh, well, the word broadly has been removed from those last oh, right. night during stage two, so you, you can take your pen to that. Um, these sections are uh, effectively technical measures, yeah. which just rely on the fact that we don't want to prejudge the precise form that any um, drafting of any amendment required to address deficiency might take. It may involve moving around words in legislation or replacing a scheme with a scheme that works in a slightly different way. But what they make clear, and what they make especially clear now that the word broadly has been removed, is that whatever the modified or replacement provision is, it must contain a protection that is equivalent to the protection that is being modified or moved. Okay. It is important to recognise that this bill does, does not and cannot innovate in policy. You know, what it does is it, it brings things in, it corrects, it deals with deficiencies, uh, and the ministers have power to do that, subject to a very high degree of scrutiny and a whole set of uh, checks and balances which we've added to this and indeed improved again at stage two. But this is not about policy change or modification. That's frustrating for people. I know it's frustrating for me, but that's not what we're doing. Okay. I think that's fine. Yeah, no, I think you've covered what I was looking for there. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, we're just trying to make sure we tick all the boxes, yeah. uh, Minister, and get all the, the, the questions uh, uh, in line. Um, there's a, f a couple other supplementaries I think people want to come in with. Jamie, did you want to come back in? Uh, oh. Just to pick up on the uh, Minister's last point, uh, when he said that this is, bill does not present any opportunity to innovate. So does he mean, therefore, that any regulations that he brings in uh, as a result of any additional powers conferred upon him or any other Scottish Minister in this bill will only deal with deficiencies, i.e. like-for-like -like replacements, as opposed to new regulations which derive from policy. I'm a bit confused by that. Well, like-for-like I'm, I'm, like is not the phrase I would use, but I'm sure Luke will explain that carefully. <coughs> Se section 11 of the bill sets out what a deficiency... Section what, sorry? Section 11, sorry, of the 11. bill sets out what a deficiency is in subsection 2. Um, that takes the... Uh, 
almost identical form to the equivalent powers in Clause 7 for UK ministers and Schedule 2 for devolved ministers in the EU Withdrawal Bill, including, importantly, now that Subsection 2 of Section 11 contains an exclusive, exhaustive list of types of deficiency. So deficiencies exist, for example, under Section 11, where they make provision for, in connection with, to take one example, reciprocal arrangements between the UK and the EU, which no longer exist. That is a, an exhaustive list of types of deficiencies. The power in Section 11, subsection 1, only can be used where ministers consider that there is a failure of devolved, retained EU law to operate effectively or any other deficiency as defined, and that it is necessary to make provision for the purpose of preventing, remedying or mitigating <coughs> failure or deficiency. <coughs> So there's quite a textured test to be applied by ministers in satisfying themselves that they have the power. That is backed up by provision in the bill, which would require ministers to set out in an explanatory statement accompanying every regulation, both that they're convinced, both that they're satisfied that the test of necessity has been met and that the provisions they're making do no more than is appropriate to remedy the deficiency that has been identified. I should point out also that the test of necessity uh, exists for us uh, as a result of recommendations from the Delegated Powers uh, yeah. Committee, amongst others, it does not exist in the UK Bill. So this is a higher test, and indeed I, I pointed out to the Delegated Powers Committee when I gave evidence last week, the test is a very severe test. I mean, there's very few pieces of legislation that talk about making provision for preventing, remedying, or mitigating the failure or other deficiency. This is a clear and very severe test of how this should be operated. To confirm, for example, that the powers in Schedule 2 of the EU Withdrawal Bill, which would be conferred on devolved administrations under that bill, do not include presently a test of necessity. So the only area of subjectivity is in whether the ministers believe that there's a deficiency or not, because that, by default, would be a subjective decision rather than subject to any test. It's, it's, it would be a decision informed by the description in Section 11, Subsection 2 of what is a deficiency. The, the power would not, uh, uh, could not be used in any areas where there was not such a deficiency. And, and that, as I pointed out last night, I think, to an amendment which you raised, uh, the, the phrase in the opinion of Scottish ministers uh, is exactly the same, swap Scottish for UK, uh, as the opinion of UK ministers. So the bills allow the opinion of ministers to guide this, subject to a huge degree of scrutiny and subject to a legislative test, which in Scotland is a more severe legislative test than that in the UK bill. So uh, I think that is a pretty much uh, hemmed in in the right way in terms of how we do this. And if I may just briefly in a supplementary, why does uh, the Minister of the panel believe that in an urgent case this should not be subject to the affirmative procedure, which I believe was another point that was mooted and voted down last night, um, which I, I felt added and, and even enhanced the scrutiny that the Minister has just discussed? Well, because the, um, the, the committee accepted last night the arguments I made, that in the case of an urgency, by definition, it is an urgency. And therefore, you have to treat it uh, more quickly and more urgently than you would something else. However, there are very strict safeguards built into the urgent procedure, uh, which we not only have accepted, but accepted uh, being strengthened during the process. So urgent cases have to be treated differently because they are urgent cases, but they can be treated and will be treated in a way <coughs> which has very substantial scrutiny and indeed the possibility not only of rebuke to the ministers, but of uh, uh, annulling or getting rid of uh, the step that ministers are trying to take. I mean, this, this bill has tighter scrutiny than the UK bill. Uh, it has more safeguards than the UK bill. Um, and of course, it is about circumstances which are not of our making. These are things we're being forced into doing because of Brexit. So we're trying to do them as quickly and as effectively as possible, but with a much stronger recognition of the need to make sure that wherever it is possible, they can be scrutinised in the best way possible. That's what we're trying to do. Just to confirm, yes. Mr Green, that the procedure that would apply to an instrument subject to Section 31 of the Continuity Bill would require a vote in Parliament on every single instrument 
At present, the bill um, requires that vote within 21, 28 days, and the Minister has committed to uh, looking at that again at stage three. This is a form of procedure that um, in the Westminster Parliament, for example, would be called made affirmative procedure. That is, there will be a vote in every case, and that is the, the, the signal feature of an affirmative procedure. The only difference is that in these cases, the regulations can come into force in advance of that vote. That's a necessary incident of the urgency of the situation which Section 31 is contemplating. Thank you for clarifying. Okay, Mary. Thank you, um, convener. And um, I want to ask a question, and, and it, it may be a, a, a very obvious question I'm asking, but I'd be grateful if you could um, answer it for me anyway. And it's dealing with deficiencies arising from UK with withdrawal. And I'm looking specifically at Section 8. Um, and it says, regulations under subsection 1 may not and it's the third point I want to ask you about, create a relevant criminal offence. Because if we have power over our justice, we have a separate justice system in Scotland, and I just wonder if you could explain what that means. Yes, I'm just look one to do so, and I will sweep up in this circumstance, because there's a political element in this too, but let uh, Luke explain mm. it legally. This is a carryover limitation from the present power in Section 2 of the European Communities Act 1972 to implement EU law which allows criminal offences to be created in broad terms where those offences can only result in imprisonment of two years or less. This is necessary because in very many cases the establishment of a regime under EU law or a set of regulations requires an enforcement mechanism to be attached to it. And very often a regulatory offence is the most appropriate enforcement mechanism. Mm. So this carries forward in effect into the fixing powers, the identical provision that we currently have in our implementation powers for EU law. Okay, that's helpful. That's helpful. And we require to do this, and we feel it's the right thing to do mm. to mirror what the existing provisions are. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you for that. Okay, I think we've exhausted our questions to you this morning, Minister, but just in, in closing, the information that we hope to get back on equal treatment. Uh, the, our understanding is equal treatment legislation is included in the list of non-legislative common frameworks where it may be required. Can you maybe give us some information on that as well when you write back to us on, on the other mm -hmm. aspects? Can, can I, perhaps it's yeah. more appropriate that I do that because th just explain what that list is. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> there were up until last Thursday four, three categories of um, three buckets, to quote Professor Tompkins, uh, there was the one that said we don't require to do anything at all. Uh, there was the one that said we require to do something but it's not going to be legislative. And there's one that says we're going to require legislation. We think, not definitely, but we think. Uh, now we've been doing what are called deep dives on this between officials in London and in Edinburgh and in Cardiff. And they've been looking at each topic to see where we are with that. Uh, and that's why the, the definitions have been reached. The UK last Thursday, without any notice to us, and indeed even without giving ministers the paper, uh, produced a new paper on this, which was more complicated, had more information, but also created a new category. And the fourth category is a category of items that they believe are reserved. Now, they've taken some of the items we'd already agreed into the three categories, taken those out and put them into the fourth category. Uh, we don't accept that. Uh, but in the interest of transparency, we've not only urged them to publish this, which they did last Friday morning, but yesterday I wrote to all members to explain the differences that we have uh, with that list. And they are the same as, uh, in broadly, where the differences that the Welsh have. The category you are talking about is a category that, that means there are either existing arrangements in place or there are arrangements could be put in place which would not require legislative action. These should not then be frozen or re-reserved uh, in any way and should continue to function. But that is presently only at the agreement of the UK government. There is no need for us to consent to that. And that is the very heart of the dispute. Uh, and that would apply to this power to, or to any power in that list or to any other power. OK. On that note, I think I know you have to go off to another committee minister and we're very grateful for you and your very officials' much. time this morning. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I'm going to suspend committee now to go into private session. Uh, we'll have a bit of a break, so quick comfort break and back in your seats.